think perhaps I'd like to have you take us through a brief outline of the career of Charlie Chaplin, his humble beginnings, how he became known and gained control in order to have the studio of his own choosing. Right. That differed from and yet set a tone for the studio system of the 30s and 40s. Yes. Uh, I think it has to do with, a lot of it has to do with the fact that there was no normal career to acting in the time that he became an actor for, um, in movies. And mostly they were, they were those people who made movies, as primarily silent movies, who were one reelers that's you know, usually up to about 13 minutes in length, those films, were people who came from the stage primarily. And sometimes they didn't even have to do that. You know, a beautiful looking damsel did not have to necessarily show much in the way of acting chops. In fact, nobody did because the real power of those films was not in acting or even a storyline, but really just action. Action without plot, for the most part, was the motto of the silent film. Um, coming up into, really, until about 1915, 16, 17, a lot of those films were very quick. Uh, they were done with the intention uh, of uh, being seen in succession, so that people would go to these little theaters and they would see them in the form, in the same format as they would see sort of, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, the musical sorts of uh, work. In other words, uh, when people went to burlesque shows, music halls, and stuff like things, they would get uh, a succession of quick acts, which lasted only a few minutes. It could be anything. It could be, you know, some kind of a clown situation. A lot of times it was physical comedy. Yeah, people were dancing and singing and juggling and tumbling over and being hit over the head with like a chicken or something. It was, it was, you know, the point was to entertain people. And there wasn't much interest in doing it in a highway, low way or any other way. It was just like, the, the point was people come and you know, to, to, to be entertained, that's what we do. It'd be one show after the other. And that's how it was on stage. And so when film began to be the form that started replacing a lot of stage reviews and burlesque shows and such, they, uh, the actors went naturally to that medium and that medium that medium started following basically the same conventions. So Charlie had a background that was fascinating because he was the probably least likely person to ever become, that you would ever imagine becoming famous. He was uh, very small and rather underfed. He had been passed over for work that, that had been given to his uh, older stepbrother, Sidney Chaplin. And Sidney had gone to work in different kinds of jobs, but he, had, but he ended up being a more successful performer early on and was able to get work with one of the sort of uh, entertainment impresarios of uh, the London stage around the year 1900, 1905, that, that period of time, 19, yeah, the, between 1900 and 1905, his brother Sidney had already started working, and he tried, Sidney did, to get Charlie to be accepted, to be hired, so that he could also have, like, a little way of, of, of living, but Charlie was very young, and so, uh, he was certainly younger than 15, let's say. <clears throat> he might have been 10 and, and even younger. And so Fred Carno passed him up numerous times. And it's on record that he had said, you know, oh, he's too scrawny. He's rather dark in 
that's somber. He doesn't have, you know, the, the performing skill that you would expect. He just doesn't seem to have the, you know, the, the grace of, 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 a, of a performer. Hang on, the grace of a performer? Like he, he found them to be, Carnot thought of Charlie as being too serious and too somber. And he didn't think that, you know, he was rather withdrawn. He didn't think that Charlie displayed the necessary qualities of showmanship that you had to have as an innate instinct, even though Charlie had had the ability to uh, to sing and to dance and to uh, sort of try magic tricks. And uh, he was very small, so he was very quick on his feet, something that you saw in almost every film until the talkies. Charlie was just very fast on his feet. But yeah, as a commercial venture, film found its most practical form in small, like I say, one ruler type of uh, physical comedies without any real scenario, plot, or script that would be shown in these small theaters that had the, uh, and then there were also like peep shows too, by the way, like machines that people would pay. And they had, uh, people would come and sit and watch one reel after another. And for them, it was like a two-dimensional version of the exact same thing that they were getting in the, uh, the English uh, and American music halls. That's exactly the same thing. And uh, <clears throat> all of this happened before Charlie kind of got involved in the movie business. In fact, before he even showed up in, before he even showed up in, uh, in the United States. Because what had happened was that when Fred Carno hired Charlie, and he was probably like 13 years old at that time, he uh, had been working his way through London where through a series of cars and lorries and stuff, they would be taken around town from one <clears throat> gate to the next, as it were, Carnot's troop. And sometimes there were just strange looking jalopies that would say things like Carnot's silent magicians or something like silent uh, minstrels. And this was all stage, not film. And one of Fred Carnot's, he's like he's the big impresario, let's say, in 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 in, in London. Uh, and one of the guys who worked for Carnot, his name was Alfred Reeves, Alf Reeves. And Alf had gotten in touch with some people in, in the United States who were very interested in the possibility of having Fred Carnot's troop travel around, bringing all of the corny magicians and musicians and you know everybody just come and perform directly in front of an American audience so that's what happened uh, Charlie signed on in 1908 with Fred Carno and in 1908 Fred Carno had been already performing his bringing his performance troupe to the United States for four years. So in 1910. Remind me again when Charlie's birthday was? He was born in 1889, April, uh, April 19th. April 20th. April 20th. Um, 1889. So when in 1910 it was decided that he could be part of that group too come to the United States, they, uh, all the musicians came and all the magicians and the entire bunch of performers came uh, by steamship together and performed in a sort of United States tour where they traveled many states and uh, performed the entire same thing that you would see in an evening in a music hall in the United States stage. In fact, the collective show was called 
an evening in an English music hall. And the posters show that. Sometimes with a slight change of title, like evening in a music hall, an English music hall or something. But it was an evening in an English music hall. And uh, he performed with several people. So he was performing in New York when he was noticed by a man who went to go and he was in New York almost coincidentally at the time he saw the show in New York. His name was Mac Sennett. And Mac Sennett had been a director of these kind of uh, peep show, one wheeler type of uh, movies in the United States. And he had gone with his girlfriend at the time, a woman whose name was Mabel Norman. Mabel was perhaps the best known silent movie star in the United States at the time. And he took notice of Charlie. And uh, he made a, an offer to Alf Reeves for Charlie to come work at the uh, motion picture company. And Max Sennett himself had gotten started in a company called Biograph, where Biograph was the, like, the main film company at the turn of the century in the United States and had directors, primarily people like E.W. Griffith, who was um, the, the, the main really silent film director in the United States. He had done films like Tolerance and very large epic types of films. And so uh, Max Sennett kind of wanted to be like the next Griffith, but the closest he could sort of get was to direct these films that were kind of really frankly a little goofy but the requirement was not there for large scale films it was really just you could just get by just making goofy films that lasted 13 minutes and everything there was no specific plan there was always like usually around five people this was based in LA and they would just go to a scene someplace any place where anything was happening whether it was a parade or like a you know like a little mini car race anything that was going on sometimes they would just go to the park and maybe three actors or four would go with Max in it and uh, there was another man by the name of Henry Lerman who worked for Mac as well did the same thing and as a director they would uh, come there would be a cameraman of course there was no there was no sound guy because sound didn't exist at the time and they would just improvise a bit of business that always ended up with something falling and somebody chasing somebody. Thank you.